We're going to be spending some time in the book of Daniel this morning, and uh, <clears throat> I know that uh, some of the messages that I've shared over the past several weeks have been for sort of hard and difficult, but uh, uh, you know, you have to share what the Lord lays upon your heart, and they've been reaffirmed in my life in so many ways in the past several weeks that, uh, that, that God truly uh, uh, wants certain things shared that are very difficult to share in these times in which we live. But uh, this morning, uh, most of us know the name of Elizabeth Elliot, who was the wife of Jim Elliot, who, uh, along with four other uh, couples, went to Ecuador and there ministered and tried to reach this unreached tribe there in the rainforest, and uh, Jim and the other men who were trying to reach them had flown into a riverbed and had landed there, and uh, they were massacred and martyred by these, uh, uh, these, uh, this, this tribe. And uh, it was truly difficult, it was very hard, the news was heard around the world. Later, Catherine and the wives went back into that area, and they were able to minister, and that tribe was converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Later she remarried and she married a man by the name of Edison Leach who was a editor and a, a theologian and he too uh, would pass away and so she was twice widowed. But she began to ask herself this question, in spite of all of this, what has not changed? In spite of all of this, what has not changed? And she began to answer that with the question of simply reciting what we call the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his son, our Lord, and, and on. And I wonder if Daniel, this morning as we look at his book once again, here he was taken into captivity in 605 B.C., if there were times in his life, if he would have had the Apostles' Creed, would have said, what has not changed? In spite of my circumstances, in spite of my situation, in spite of what has happened, this mess that I'm in, what has not changed? And I think he would have answered it the same way that Elizabeth Elliot did. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord. And we actually catch a glimpse of that in chapter 3 of the book of Daniel that we'll quickly look at this morning. But it was laid upon my heart some time ago. I happened across an article, and maybe some of you have also read it. Andrew Brunson was a pastor, a missionary, a church planter in Turkey. And around 2016 or thereabouts, he was arrested by the Turkish government and he was placed into prison because they said he was spying. It was espionage. And so they put him into prison. They, they actually sentenced him to life imprisonment. And there he spent the next several years of his life. His wife had also been arrested, but she eventually then was released. But he spent that time there in that Turkish prison. And what he says really has touched my heart, has focused me once again upon the necessity of preparing for the times in which we live. And I want to read to you some of the things that he was saying because he says, I believe that God was in many ways preparing me and he allowed me to be put into that prison so that I could give this message to the Christian church today. But he says, I thought I'd be in Turkey the rest of my life doing church planting, but apparently God had other plans. Nothing, he said, equipped me for the kind of persecution that I experienced. I had counted the cost for some pressure, but certainly not prison. And he talks about how being in that prison and being tortured and harassed and threatened and, and all the things that come from being in a prison like that, how the despair at many times just absolutely just got to him and broke him. And he says, every time I broke, I had to get up again and learn perseverance at a deeper level. He says, and I quote, God allowed me to be broken like that so, I could gain an so that I could be an encouragement to other people who are going to face persecution. I've really had something burning on my heart, he said, especially the last few weeks. There's a real change taking place in our country in this generation. The hostility toward followers of Jesus Christ is going to rise. The pressure is coming and is coming very quickly now, and I believe a great sorting is coming to the church and there will be a lot of division. There will be a temptation to compromise, and it's already happening. One thing I want to underline from my experience is that those who persecute are going to justify it by saying we are the hate group, that we have a message of hate. People are going to say that Christians are a threat to safety. You can't work here. Your views make people unsafe. You can't use social media. You can't use your bank account, your credit cards, things like that. 
And for churches, you can't keep your de designation as a tax-exempt nonprofit. Compromise will be the easy way out. Well, we go back to Daniel, and Daniel, of course, was taken captive in 605 BC. It was the first of three deportations that Nebuchadnezzar under the Babylonian Empire had come, and they had taken them back to the, to the area of Babylon. And if you've ever known and studied the Babylonian culture, in fact, there's a book out that was written many, many, many moons ago called The Greatness That Was Babylon. But it was a culture of, of demon worship, astrology, magic, prostitution, you name it. There was a lot of things going on. It was a kind of society that you really don't want to raise your children in. And yet how ironic that we are living in sort of a culture like that today because we have a great assault happening upon our children. And I think we need to pray for our children, you know, today, because there's so many things that are happening that, that we need to make sure they're, they're grounded in the faith, they're grounded in the Word of God. But these Jews who had been brought back, there were some of those who were weak, and they compromised, and they gave in to the Babylonian system and culture. But we also know that there were those like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego who hung to their faith and who stood fast to their, to their God, and regardless of what was happening in that Babylonian culture, they were committed to walking with the Lord and serving Him and, and, and being faithful and true to Him. And so Daniel was part of this group. And what we find is that he was about 14 or 15 or 16 years of age. And it's amazing here that here was a young teenager who was holding fast to God. Next week, God laid it upon my heart to talk about a young girl who was about 12 or 14 years of old, who has a tremendous message for each and every one of us. But here is Daniel. He's about 14 or 15 years of old. And he comes in this area where Babylon, had, where Babylon is, is, is trying to re-educate them. It was Nebuchadnezzar's plan to re-educate them, to retrain them, to erase their past, give them a new identity, give them a new faith, to change who they were in life. And so they changed their names, they changed their faith, they had Babylonian gods for their own names. And there was just a, you know, just a lot of pressure there to, to, to go along. You know, they wanted them to actually be, well, they could be Jews on the outside, but they wanted them to think like Babylonians on the inside. And in today's world, we've heard about what is called practical atheists. In other words, we profess to be Christians, but we act as if we don't know God or God is not, you know, who we said he is. And so in some ways, they were practical Jews or practical atheists. On the outside, they looked like Jews, but on the inside, they were actually Babylonian in their thinking. But Daniel and his friends stood their ground and they stood their faith. And regardless of this attempt to re-educate, to retrain, to replace their faith, to wipe it out, and to give them a new identity in this Babylonian system, we find that it says in the book of Daniel, very simply it says, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's rich food and with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And so what we find there is that Daniel resolved. He had that, that resolve in his heart. I am not going to walk away with my God. I'm going to stand on my faith. And perhaps the only thing he had was, again, his, his, the verses that he had memorized from the Torah. He had, you know, his own uh, 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 prayers that he continued to pray. But he continued to practice this in the midst of this Babylonian system. And he put it to the test in this Babylonian empire. The second story, of course, is one I have always liked. And that concerns the friends of his, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what we find is here they are in this follower of group, and they're fed, facing this tremendous pressure to conform. There's this pressure from the powers that be, this pressure to conform. And there's this fear, this intimidation, these threats that are happening to them day in and day out. And we know in chapter 3 that Nebuchadnezzar tells the people, unless you bow down and worship, you know, me, and worship these gods, you'll be thrown into that fiery furnace. Now, can you imagine this, friends? Because we could call this peer pressure. Okay, we have peer pressure today, but here they were standing there and all of a sudden the music begins to play and all of these people fall flat on their face to worship and you're the only ones left standing. You know, in the way today's world, you want to say, wait a minute here, I don't want to stand out like that. And the temptation is to compromise and to fall flat on our face. But they were intimidated. They were threatened. They were they were provoked. They were ridiculed. They were mocked. And then Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, if you don't bow, you're going to be thrown to that fiery furnace. And again, they had a resolve in their heart that says, we, don't, we believe that our God is going to deliver us. And even if he doesn't, we're still going to believe in him. 
Then we come to the third example here, and that is Daniel in the lion's den, a story that's familiar to each and every one of us. And here's Daniel. He's a part of this administration now and of the powers that be. And he has friends around him, or he thought they were friends. They're really not. But they become very jealous and very envious of him. And they can't seem to get him to do anything illegal because he's a person of integrity. He's a person of honesty, a person of character. So since they can't get him to do anything illegal, they decide to outlaw his religious faith. And they come to the king and said, you know what? We ought to have a law that says no one should worship any other god but you for the next 30 days or so. And if anyone does, they need to be thrown at the lion's den. And here's what Daniel does. He, he goes into his house. He bows down on his knees and he begins to pray. He does what he has always done. And that is to pray and seek God's face. And of course, we all know what happens to him. They catch him praying. They said, aha, we got him. And they have him tossed into the lion's den and hopefully to be consumed by the lions. But we know a different story and a result happens to that. But you know, I stop and I think about Charlie Schultz, who, Charles Schultz, who did the Charlie Brown and the Peanuts cartoon. It's, you know, it's a way old cartoon and they don't do it anymore. But he always had a faith-oriented message to his cartoons. And one of his very first cartoons was Charlie was walking up the road, but sitting along the curbside was a little boy and a little girl. And another boy had come up to them. And as they turned, he saw Charlie Brown coming up the street. And he says, oh, here comes good old Charlie Brown. And Charlie Brown comes walking by and he says, here, good old Charlie Brown. Yes, sir, good old Charlie Brown. And then as Charlie Brown passes out of earshot, he turns to the little couple there on the sidewalk and says, Good old Charlie Brown. Yes, sir. Boy, I sure do hate him. And you know, how many times have we been told to our face, you know, that people love us, people respect us, people adore us, or whatever it might be. But in their own heart, they're saying, Boy, I despise them. I hate them. And that's what these people were doing with Daniel. On the outside, it looked as if somehow they were his friends. But inside, they had this deep hatred for Daniel because he served a living God. So with this morning, I will come back to what Andrew Brunson has said because one of the things that he said that really has challenged my heart was, he says, it's a lot more difficult to face persecution than you think it is. We think that somehow, you know, we'll be able to fly by with living collars. He says, no, it's a lot more difficult, a lot more difficult than you imagine. And I think about Cardinal uh, 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 Joseph Zen. He, he was in a prison in communist China. And he said, martyrdom, martyrdom is normal in our church. We may not have to do that, but we may have to bear some pain and steel ourselves or equip ourselves for our loyalty to our faith. And I think what he's trying to say here is that we need to come together and support one another and encourage one another. But, you know, I just read the latest... The latest uh, uh, article and, and, and uh, uh, survey upon the most persecuted places on, in, on the planet. North Korea is at the very top. Now friends, we may not have to experience persecution to the extent that people in North Korea are experiencing it, but we need to learn how to steel ourselves, prepare ourselves, equip ourselves, encourage one another, walk with one another, be there for one another. Why? Because Jesus said this, look, they hated me and they rejected my message. So they're going to hate you and reject your message. The servant is not greater than the master. So what do we do? And here's what he suggested. He said, we need to, first of all, talk about it. And I want to say talk about it. I want to stick my head in the sand. I don't want to even talk about it. Why? Because we in America, you know, we're accustomed to ease. We're accustomed to comfort. We'll say, it'll never happen here. It will never come here. That's impossible. We struggle with the thought of it. We, we, we cringe at the very thought of it. And yet we know that whatever form it might come in, that we experience it. It may not be physical, but we experience persecution in all forms. We may experience it domestically. I mean, you might be a husband or a wife and you have a husband or a wife or a child or whatever it might be who, who doesn't like the Christian faith. And they, they cause all sorts of conflict within that home. It might be because you're in a school system or whatever it might be and you have friends socially who bully you because you dare stand with God. I just saw a tremendous film that, that in some ways related that. You know, it might be, you know, it might be physical, it might be social, it might be domestic, it might be mental, it might be emotional. It could be religious. I mean, in today's world we, we find that people of faith have a tendency to attack one another. 
You know, I think about how it is that we always like to lift up today and say, well, you know, you're to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you don't do that, you're automatically a hate person. But we need to read that all in its context. But does persecution happen? I don't know how it might happen. I don't know how it might, how it might come to our life. But I, I just think of some few simple ones that, you know, while they may not seem like a big deal, still is it only the big tip of the iceberg. I think of a, of a, of a woman in, in England who was praying, and she was praying outside of a clinic. And uh, the, the, a guard, a security guard came up to her, a police officer came up to her, and asked her if she was protesting. She was standing there back away, of, back away from the building, and she was just standing there, you know, with her eyes closed. He asked if he, she was protesting, and she said no. And he said, are you praying? And she said, well, yes, I am. And he said, well, you know, you can't pray in this area. And he arrested her and took her off to jail for praying. You know, why is it that people are threatened by prayers? I think of two reasons. One, it convicts them. And two, they know that prayer is powerful and it's an idol-busting activity. You know, they don't want their gods destroyed and so they outlaw prayer. I think just recently, a couple weeks ago, there was a police officer down south who was a Christian, a young man, walked with God and he had his own little social media podcast site. And he was commended by the police uh, officers and his powers that be, commended. He said they were said he was doing a great job, a good job. But he posted something about believing in traditional marriage. And they brought him in and basically intimidated him and threatened him and said, you can't talk about that because, you know, it keeps you from doing your job. Well, rather than, you know, be fired, he eventually resigned. But again, because he dared stand up for what he believed in, he was released from his job even though he was doing something well. A man in the Mall of America was walking through the mall with a Jesus Saves on his t-shirt. He was told he had to receive, remove his, his sweatshirt because the message Jesus Saved was offensive to all the other shoppers in the mall. I think of a realtor who had a sign outdoors on a, on a yard and on her sign she had a little Christian message. She was told that she had to remove that message because it was offensive to those in the neighborhood. And I just think recently of the, of the high school students who were basically kicked out of the Smithsonian Institute because they dared wear a toboggan or a knit cap on their hat and they had their message on it which they believed in life. You know, we don't know how it's going to come. You know, we don't know what, what's going to transpire in our life. But he says we need to actually talk about it. And I like what John Stott says. Persecution is simply the clash between two irreconcilable value systems. Persecution is simply the clash between two irreconcilable value systems. And then he says, secondly here, we need to pursue intimacy with God. And he talks about how it was in 2007, he began to, to pray and he said, you know, God, I don't really love you like I should. God, I, you know, I, I want to love you with all my heart, soul, mind and strength. And he, he, him and his wife Noreen began to get together and he said they began to pray. He said, I, I, I began to realize later on that it was this intimacy with God, this love for God that helped me to persevere in that Turkish prison during those years that I was confined there. But he said, he, says, he said, we talk about loving God, and he says it can be very abstract. So I started saying, God, I don't love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, but I want to. I want more of you. And I think about that phrase in the book of Psalms 42 where it says, As a deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my heart for thee, O God. In other words, God, make my heart hungry for you. God, make my heart thirsty for you. Well, Andrew Brunson finds himself in that Turkish prison, and he says, one night I was just absolutely down. I was devastated. I was in despair. And he says, I lay alone on my bed, isolated with fear and grief welling up inside of me. And a prayer kept going through my mind. Where are you, God? Why have you permitted them to return me to this awful place? Why haven't you intervened? Why are you so far away? Why are you so silent? And he says, I found myself when I opened my mouth simply saying, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And he says, that was my victory. He says, yes, I do love you. Even if you're silent, I love you. Even if you allow my enemy to hurt me, I love you. Even if you do not give me your presence, I still love you. I don't need answers. I'm focused on loving you. Does that sound like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who says, you know, we're going to believe in God regardless? I mean, they believe that obedience was, was, was better than deliverance for them. 
But I stop and I think about this, it's that, that the intimacy that leads us to perseverance, and I have to ask myself, in my own heart, in my own life, do I have that thirst for God? Do I have that thirst for God like David had? Do I have that thirst for God like the bride had in the Song of Solomon that says, my heart runs after you, draw me close to you. Does my heart thirst for God like Cornelius in the book of Acts? I think of Joy Mora. Joy Mora was a, a Marine. He was on board of a, a ship in the Iranian Sea during the Iraqi War. And he uh, accidentally, well, I guess you could, it's the only way they can do it, accident. He, he fell overboard. And what boggles my mind was it was 36 hours before they discovered that he was missing. Well, after 36 hours of him missing, they finally sent out a search and rescue team. And they searched for 24 hours, and they still didn't find him. And so they just presumed that he was missing, and they pronounced him probably dead. But unknowns to them, there were four Palestinian fishermen who spotted him in the ocean. He, what he had done was, he, he was there in the ocean, and he had made a flotation device out of his trousers. And when they found him, he was asleep. He was floating around on those trousers asleep. He was parched. He was thirsty. His tongues were cracked. I mean, he was dehydrated. And they plucked him from that, that sea. You know, it's just like finding a needle in a haystack. Two years later, he was on NBC Dateline with Stone Phillips. And Stone Phillips was asking him about his experience of being missing like that and being found by these fishermen. And he says that through all of it, he knew that God truly longed for him to survive. And that's what he kept focusing upon as he was in that, was in that water, you know, that God would rescue him, that God would deliver him. And then he was asked what thought that really, you know, bothered him the most. He says, here I was surrounded by all this water. But the thought that kept pounding through my head was water, water, water. Just happened to see a little documentary on the USS Indianapolis. You know, horrible, horrible experience. You know, here they are in the midst of this water. They can't drink it. Water, water. For four days, they try to survive with sharks swimming around them. You dehydrated. What happens is that you, you lose your senses. You lose your, your ability to navigate. You can't think straight. You begin seeing things like islands over here, and you try to swim to that island. Water, water, water. The psalmist says, oh, as a deer pants for the water brook, so pants my heart for thee. And what he's saying is, oh, God, I want you, and I want you real bad. And too often in my life, I think sometimes my song is prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the Lord I love. And I might not be prone to leave, but truly, you know, there are times in your life where your love can grow cold. And you don't read the word as we should. We don't pray as we should. We don't witness as we should. Our love for God grows cold in our life. And so I pray, Lord, help me to be thirsty for you and help me to maintain my hunger for you in the midst of it all. And then, then he says, thirdly, says we have to develop the right perspective. And here he simply says that we need to fear God rather than man. And I think about the middle verse of all the Bible, Psalm 118, verse 8 and 9, it says, Trust in the Lord and don't put your confidence in man. I think about what Jesus said. He said, you know, don't fear man. He can take your body, but, you know, worship God, fear God, because he deals with your eternity. But we need to have that right perspective. And then he says we need to determine ahead of time to follow Jesus. You know, we have to determine ahead of time that we're going to walk with God. Daniel knew how to pray before he got into the midst of the crisis. You can't just learn how to do something in the midst of it all. You have to know how to do it beforehand. And so we have to determine ahead of time to follow Jesus and to walk with him and, and to be there for him. And then last of all, he says, we need to stand on the word. And in this world of lies and deceit, we have to learn to lean upon the word of truth that comes from the God who is truth. And Jesus says, thy word is truth. It's our map. It's our compass. It's our North Star. It's our playbook, however you want to put it. But the word of God helps us to maintain it. And it comes back to, you know, uh, I think about Nicole memorizing scripture. You know, they, they can take away, you know, everything you have and they can take away the Bible, but they can't take away the word that's hidden in your heart. It will continue to minister to you even in the midst of a prison cell. But here's Elizabeth Elliot, and what does she say? You know, in spite of all these things, what has not changed? And she says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and she quoted the Apostles' Creed. You know, persecution, as I hate it to say it, is probably imminent. It's closer than perhaps what we think. And it's difficult. I don't even like to think about it. I cringe at the very thought of it. But I remember when I was a teenager, my dad used to receive a magazine called Underground Evangelism. And I was always in anticipation of receiving that magazine because my heart just went out to these, these people behind the Iron Curtain at that time who were suffering for their faith. You know, and it was a very big magazine, but story after story after story after story. And my heart just, again, just went out to them. But there was one story I always remember, and I ordered his book. It was basically just a run off of a, of a little printing press and stapled together. But it was a book by Harlan Popoff called Tortured for His Faith. He spoke here at the church one time. But I remember him saying there he was in a Romanian prison camp because he was a Romanian pastor preaching the word and he was arrested and tried and tortured. And he was really down in the dumps and he was just really having a difficult time. And he says he got up one morning and he looked out his barracks window and the snow had freshly fallen on the ground and it was on the ground and on the rooftops across the way. And as he looked across the way, the freshly fallen snow on the barracks rooftop, there was a shadow of a cross. God was speaking to him in the midst of all that pain and suffering that God still cared for him. And last week, I know it perhaps was a hard message to hear about, but you know, God is on the throne and that's the good news. God is king. And not only is he your king, but he's my daddy, he's my father. And as Doris Price always reminded me, you know, that I'm a king's kid. All right, and so are you if you're a believer. So our king is a father, but my father loved me so much that he sent his son to do for me what, he could not, what I could not do for myself. And he gave his life for me because he loved me. And he was the real Daniel who went into the real lion's den for each and every one of us. He was the one who's the fourth man in the furnace who walks with us through the fire and through the suffering. And Paul once again says, and I'll remind you in Romans chapter 8, that nothing, not even persecution, shall separate me from his love. Here's Daniel. He's read, we, last week we talked about all these monsters and all these beasts. It's a horrifying vision that he's received. But in chapter 9, he's praying. And he's praying and he's praying and he's praying and he's praying. And he's asking God to forgive him, to forgive his nation, and, and to make them strong. And he's, you're the covenant God. Lord, Lord, please deliver us. And he's praying and he's praying and he's praying. And you know, sometimes we talk about praying and you don't receive an answer right away. And you talk about yes, no, and maybe. Well, we also need to understand that sometimes we have to understand our prayers are held up because of a spiritual warfare in the heavenlies. And that's what Daniel is reminded of. There's a spiritual warfare in the heavenlies that's conflicting with our prayers but God's agenda will always prevail. And I like what it says because there's an angel called Gabriel who comes to Daniel. And he says this, At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, at the beginning of your prayer for mercy, a word went out. And I have come to tell you that you are greatly loved. And when I read that verse, you know, how many of you have shivers go up and down your spine? You know, you read the word or something. All of a sudden, God just talks to you. You know, I've heard your prayer for mercy. And I want you to know you are deeply and greatly loved. And that love for me has been shown to me in Jesus Christ. Again, the real Daniel who went into the lion's den for me, who stands with me in the fiery furnace, who prevailed for me, endured for me, who won the victory for me. And I want to come before the Lord and say, Lord God, help me to be hungry for you, thirsty for you. Help me to love you, God, and help me to endure and be faithful to you. It's not about deliverance. It's about obedience. And above all, Lord, help me to be obedient and help me to love you in spite of. Because I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And I believe in Jesus Christ, his son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, descended to hell, and the third day he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, where he sits at the throne. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I mean, go back and read that Apostles' Creed, and make that your affirmation of faith, because in spite of the circumstances, it will help us to endure the storms. Most of all, I can see Jesus Christ standing here beside me, encouraging me, upholding me, and walking with me. It may come, 
It may not come, but we all need to be prepared for it. Precious Lord, we come to you today. And Lord Jesus, it's hard and difficult to talk about things like this, but you've, you've, already, you've already forewarned us. If they hated you, people are going to hate us. They're going to disagree with us. They're going to call us haters. And I can think of situations in my life, and even just most recently, why, why you know, you're basically being blamed for saying things, and, and we're just standing upon our convictions. Lord God, I pray, fill us with your spirit. Help us to stand. You loved us enough to give your life for us. Lord, help us to love you enough that we would give our lives for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, may you go forth in peace, and may God truly be your shield, your refuge, and your strength always, each and every day. Amen.